Hi there, sportsmen. I have a great practical way to fish for bluegills with night crawlers. Use a half a crawler at the most. I'll explain why. We'll also talk about white-tailed deer, what they're doing to make it through the heat of the summer. Stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost with tips on how you can become a more practical sportsman. You know what kind of fish this is? We'll get back to that in a minute, but notice how the larger fish hang near the bottom. Keep that in mind when you fish for panfish. Now here's a panfish with blue markings on the cheek. It's a green sunfish. Longer body and head than the common bluegill right here. I want you to notice how small the mouth on a bluegill is compared to the larger mouth of, oh, say, the catfish. What kind of catfish is this? That's a bullhead, you can tell by the rounded tail. Bullheads gobble worms and can be caught easily because they have such big mouths. And so does a channel catfish. Now I know this is a channel cat because of the fork in its tail. Here's a yellow perch. Now watch how it swims with its dorsal fin down. Puts it up to stabilize when it stops. When it starts to swim, puts it back down. Perch are easier to catch on big worms and on minnows because a perch's mouth is noticeably larger than a bluegill's. The size of a fish's mouth makes a big difference on how you catch them. This fish is common to probably most lakes in Michigan and throughout the country for that matter. It's a gar, sometimes called a gar pike because of its shape, but it has a prehistoric bony bill that's full of teeth. Gar frequently steal bait from anglers, but they're nearly impossible to catch on hook and line because there's nothing soft to hook. Rock bass, on the other hand, are easy to catch because they have soft mouths, easy to hook, and their mouths are larger than a bluegill, and they can easily gobble down a whole night crawler. The walleye, an even bigger mouth, crawler harnesses are a favorite bait, but in the aquarium, walleye don't like those bright camera lights. But they do hug the bottom, just like you find them most of the time, in most inland lakes. Now let's drop a night crawler into the tank, see what happens when a bluegill tries to eat it. Okay, that night crawler is about this size, one that you and I would think would be terribly attractive to a panfish. And you know, we normally think that the bigger the bait, the bigger the fish. But you have to keep in mind, really, that night crawlers this size are far too big for most panfish. Now this crawler doesn't have a hook in it. It's floating freely, but where would you hook it if you were fishing? Do you hook it once through the middle, or do you hook it once on one end? And which end, the front or the back? Well, it looks like this fish grabs worms from the back. Or hold it, is that the front? <laughs> if you hook the crawler in the wrong end, your bobber would be dancing around upstairs, and you'd be all excited that a big one had just swallowed the crawler. But look at what really happened. This bluegill is having a heck of a time handling a full-size night crawler, and it doesn't even have a hook in it. If you would have tried to set the hook, you would have come up with an empty hook or maybe a half a crawler at best. But the bluegill still hasn't swallowed it all the way. Now let's drop down another worm, this time not quite so big. Now I know what you're going to say. You're going to say if you use just a little worm, all of the little bluegills are going to pounce on it, and you'll never have a chance at a bigger one. But let's look at how this decent-sized bluegill handles a little worm. The worm tumbles through the water and disappears in an instant. A bluegill sucks in its food by opening its gills, which causes water to rush into its mouth, bringing the food with it. And if you have a worm on your hook, you can see that you can set the hook right away, and that bluegill would be on its way to your stringer. If you don't set the hook, the bluegill might feel it and spit it back out. Now I want you to look at what a small mouth even a big bluegill has. Now this bluegill was mounted by Franklin Soltz and hangs on the trophy wall at the museum, but keep this mouth size in mind. It's not nearly as large as a rock bass or a crappie, and if you're fishing for pumpkin seeds or sunfish, I mean they're even smaller with smaller mouths. And here it is, an optimistic pumpkin seed that decides to vacuum a night crawler up off the bottom. No way it can handle this crawler with any decorum or table manners. And this is a keeper-sized pumpkin seed with the proverbial too big of a bite. Now, while it's trying to munch this down, a small perch tackles a night crawler, but only for an instant. Too big. 
While all that was going on, our gluttonous pumpkin seed, with its eyes much bigger than its stomach and its mouth, continues the struggle. This is what goes on under your bobber, and all you see is twitching. Even two good-sized bluegills can be having a tug-of-war with your bait, and if you try to set the hook in the middle of this, you'll pull it away from both of them. Kind of interesting, isn't it, to observe fish feeding? My conclusion is that these big mouthfuls of crawlers are too big for most panfish. So instead of this, you'd be a lot better off to use a smaller worm and gob it on your hook except leave the ends dangling a little bit. Use a split shot to get it right down to the bottom because that's where these big ones are and set the hook as soon as you feel a bite. Watching fish in our new aquarium is going to open our eyes to what really goes on under the bobber. I'll tell you, there's no better time to kick back and enjoy fishing, at least relaxed fishing, than at this time in the summer. It's often cool out on the water, but did you ever stop and think what wildlife do in the heat of the summer when the sun is bearing down and it's humid? Well, white-tailed deer have some unusual adaptations they use to make it through the heat of the summer. White-tailed deer in early summer are sort of mysterious. They seem to disappear from their normal roadside and field edge haunts during the months of June and July, but they don't go any place. In fact, that's the problem if you like to watch deer. They don't go any place. They like to stick close to their bedding and feeding areas, and usually these areas are next to each other, or in many cases, in early summer, they feed and bed down in the same place. Do the deer in the background look like they're standing? Well, they're not. They're bedded in the shade right next to a field full of lush greenery that they find tasty and full of nutrition. Now, deer don't often bed down, as we call it, to sleep. They lay down to rest while they chew their cud, just like a cow. Deer never go farther than they need to for food, water, and cover. And in the summer, these requirements are closer together than at any other time of year. That means the deer actually are traveling less right now because they don't have to. Besides, the does are busy with their fawns and fawns don't travel far. The bucks are growing their antlers. You can see the velvety spikes on many of these bucks. This is a quiet time of year for deer, but they don't relax. Deer never relax. They're always on the lookout for wolves or coyotes or anything that would attack them or their fawns. John Ford was taping this footage a few weeks ago with nothing really in mind other than to document whatever the deer were doing at this time of year. And he got the most unusual sequence on tape. Now these deer sort of look like they're scenting the wind, maybe sensing danger. Well, it turned out they weren't. They evidently were smelling something from above, the leaves on the trees and the leaves evidently smelled good enough to eat. Watch these deer as they check out the leaves. Now keep in mind there's plenty of food underneath their feet and in the field within easy reach. The younger shoots, the tender green buds, these hold more nutrition, but this buck wants leaves that are almost out of reach. What kind of leaves are these that are so magnetic? Well, they sort of look like big tooth aspen leaves, but I'm, I'm really not sure. Somebody will tell me after they see this show. Maybe somebody can fill me in on the behavior of deer at this time of year when they stand on their back feet and reach high for what must be pretty good tasting stuff. Watch this buck. He isn't in it just for a bite or two. He likes these leaves a lot.
Have you ever seen anything like this in the summer? I've seen deer reach for apples and trees in the fall, but never do this in early summer when food appears to be abundant all around them. You know, I know we feel mighty hot in this weather. The deer feel hot too, but their summer coats are made of very thin hair that has no particular insulating value. The way deer stay cool is not by sweating like we do. They don't have the same kind of sweat glands like humans. Probably has something to do with survival. Sweating puts out a lot of scent. So instead of perspiring, deer breathe through their mouths at a faster rate than normal, sort of panting. And the cooler air goes into their lungs their body heat is carried by blood vessels in their lungs, which transfers that body heat to the air in their lungs, and they breathe that warm air out, sort of like an air exchange cooling system. So when you see a deer panting with its mouth open on a hot day, it's doing the same thing a dog is doing by panting. It's cooling itself off, and it does this instead of sweating. Now, although these deer seem calm, at least not as wired as they do around hunting season, they're not totally relaxed. They always keep an eye and an ear open for danger. Their wired behavior in the fall doesn't have anything to do with hunting season. In the fall, the metabolism of a deer changes, picks up a faster pace, the weather cools down, the days get shorter. Mother Nature brings in their breeding instincts. All of these natural biological things put deer on edge, and if the truth were known, I'm sure that deer have no idea when hunting season is or what it is. They live each day, one day at a time, surviving the best they can. I don't think there's any animal that's as fun to watch or more interesting and often more mysterious than the white-tailed deer. Just what are they doing when they reach up for leaves in the summer? I mean, why these leaves? What's the big attraction? Anybody know? Drop me a line and maybe we can clear up this mystery. years old and you got a gar some people call it a gar pike that is 45 inches long and it doesn't it looks like you cut it on hook and line yep that's hard to do yeah you know I mean the mouth the mouth of a gar is just full of teeth and bony how did you hook it I let him swallow the middle so he just took in the middle and swallowed it did you watch this yeah right next to the boat had you been like fiddling around with this gar? Or yeah, there were four of them that came in and three of them left and then he came back and stayed there for a while. And you, you fiddled around and let him suck it in? Yeah. And how did it fight? It, uh, it fought better than a bass. Is that right? When you got it in the boat, how did, how did you, how'd you get it in the boat? I mean, those teeth, the mouth is just full of teeth. Well, I only had my uh, bass net little bass net so I had to grab a hold of him behind the gills and I grabbed a hold of him behind the ribs and threw him in the boat real quick. Oh I guess did, did he snap or anything did it with his mouth? He flipped around a little bit he didn't snap. Okay I, I just wondered I've never had one in the boat like that. I think catching a gar pike like that the, the, the boy deserves a round of applause. I would think that's great but he's not done. You have a story this doesn't look like a qualifier is it? Uh, I don't know. Oh you didn't measure it? Yeah, I measured it. It was 36 and a half inches. Yeah, that's about, that's a, that's a three and a half inches short, but that looks like a northern muskie. Yep. And you got it from the same place? No, I got it from the Upper Peninsula. I'll be darned. You're fishing um, when, in the spring? I got these both in the middle of summer. Well, with fishing credentials like that, hey, this guy knows his stuff. We have to make Kevin Chittam from Clark Lake our real tree. Practical Trophy Angler of the Week. Unless you know William Wiswell from Grand Rapids, um, I'm sure you've never had a recipe like this. He calls it Venatio, Ven Venatio, something like it, fruit stew. It's an Italian dish. It calls for a, a couple pounds of venison cubed with no fat or fell on it, which you brown in about two tablespoons of peanut oil. Okay, fairly straightforward right here, but remember this is a fruit stew. It has a number of spices in it. It has green pepper, onion, uh, 
tomatoes, and no, that's not cheese. That is, of all things, sweet potatoes. You take the sweet potatoes, cut them into one-inch cubes, put them into a dish, then you put in tomatoes. Now, I know sweet potatoes, tomatoes, it doesn't sound like a real good combination. Dump the green pepper and onion on top of it. Hey, this is surprising, though. Ground cinnamon goes on top of that. Then you smash a garlic clove, drop that into the mixture so far, put some water in there, add a little uh, ground pepper and salt. You're going to take this and put it in the oven. You mix it up in a three-quart casserole dish and mix all the ingredients, except we have three to go. Put this in the oven for about an hour and a quarter at 350 degrees. After that's done, you stir in the corn and the zucchini. You bake that another 45 minutes. Now, after that bakes, you add peach slices. That's right, peach slices. Can you dig this? I mean, uh, corn on the cob, zucchini. I tell you, it is one crazy dish, but is it tasty? Our patriarch of the outdoors, Mr. Michigan Outdoors, Mort Neff, renders his opinion. From now on, it's going to take a lot of deer hunters' opinion uh, to, uh, to join me in giving Bill the Venadio Fruit Stew Award. And I think it'll change a lot of hunters' idea. They're going to start looking for bucks going through fruit orchards. <laughs> okay. Well, John, we have two for the stew. Yes, puts me in the spot here in the middle. The um, soup is... Very good. I mean, big chunks of fish and vegetables. And I, for one, always have um, had a thing with food that's boring. You know, I like food that just gets up and grabs you. And this definitely is, is the item. Um, I did also vote for the stew only because of the creativity involved in there. I, I mean, all the way from peaches to sweet potatoes to venison to zucchini, the tomato base and the corn. I mean, you wouldn't think it would taste good, and it does blend together very well. Several weeks ago, the Walpole Island Indian tribe on the eastern shore of Lake St. Clair announced that they were laying claim to all fishing rights on all the waters of Lake St. Clair and the St. Clair River and would charge all anglers, American and Canadian, a $24 fishing license fee. According to DNR Law Chief Herb Burns, the Indians haven't taken any action yet, and if they do, the U.S. Coast Guard would most likely be called in to enforce the international boundaries. Another Canadian story, the Ontario government has ended rebates on two sales taxes for non-residents, an 8% service and merchandise tax, and a 5% hotel accommodation tax. Now the only tax rebate remaining is the 7% goods and services tax, which has a number of restrictions. The DNR says the black bear population seems to be up, and the problem with nuisance bears is increasing in the UP. Now, lowering the number of bear permits seems to have caused this otherwise unexplainable increase. And finally, a so-called animal rights activist, a rich California kid who says the MSU mink were political prisoners, has been indicted for bombing the MSU mink research facility in 1992. PETA supporters have been linked as well, and more arrests are expected. I find the press coverage on this animal rights stuff really irritating. Two weeks ago, Sunday's Detroit News headlines read, Animal Activist Accused in Bombing? Say what? I don't recall any headlines saying, Iranian Activist Accused in Bombing. I mean, people who bomb are generally called terrorists. But apparently the liberal press in America makes an exception for those animal rights wackos. Now, the Detroit News article is continued on page 4. The headline here is, Animal Rights. Are Activists Going Too Far? Say what? These idiots have bombed buildings, burned down laboratories, vandalized and stolen animals and property, and the Detroit News poses the question, have these bozos gone too far? I mean, why didn't they ask, did Hitler go too far? I mean, wasn't Hitler an Aryan activist? Well, no, he was a terrorist. So are these animal rights jerks. Now, I don't care if they bomb a building or throw tomato juice on somebody wearing a fur coat. They're terrorists, plain and simple. The liberal American press ought to admit it, and our judicial system ought to prosecute it. That's my opinion. I'm really looking forward to the 1st of September. That's going to not only start our new TV season, where we do 36 brand new shows for the coming year. In our A-Clays trailer is a, a 50-target course, and there's two of them, one on each side of the trailer. We demonstrated this at the outdoor fair in June. And it is an exciting course to shoot, all kinds of angles, all kinds of targets. 
Uh, it is, isn't as competitive as trap as trap and skeet. It's a lot of fun, give you good practice for hunting. So remember, that's the first full weekend in August. Get your earmuffs, your hat, your gun. Come on out and join us. Have a good weekend. We'll see you next week. In the heat of the summer, there's no better place to be than out on the water. Two weeks ago, we were 42 miles off Marquette. Standard Rock, that classic lake trout fishing spot. Mm. Captain Jim Mackey showed us some lake trout fishing that you're going to see next spring on our new season of Practical Sportsman. This week, we went down to Monroe to fish Lake Erie, gather some information on their techniques. I tell you, there's a lot to do. I hope you can get outdoors, and I hope you can join us next week, same time, same station, for Practical Sportsman.